Uh, next up, another uh, researcher from my group at MIT, uh, Ronan Dorley. Uh, Ronan was a postdoc in the group uh, last year. He will be returning shortly as a research scientist, so uh, we'll be uh, thrilled to have him back. Uh, Ronan will talk about urban, model, uh, urban mobility modeling uh, using mobile phone data, and uh, he, he's been working with, specifically with the Andorra data for the, for the past year or so. So he's interested in uh, the optimization of transportation networks and modeling the health, uh, environmental, and, and uh, time travel impacts. So Ronan Dorley. Good morning, everyone. So my background is in transportation modeling, and so I'm interested in using data and numerical models in order to better understand urban mobility, and then to use these models in order to design interventions um, to help cities to function better. And so last year, I was on a Fulbright scholarship at the Media Lab, and so I was working on the Andorra project, and through this pro project, we had access to three months' worth of uh, high-resolution telecom data for Andorra. And so this is data that's routinely uh, collected by telecom providers, but as it turns out, it's also a very rich data set for mobility analysis. So the first idea I had for using this data was to develop an origin destination matrix for Andorra. And so OD matrices are used by transport planners in order to represent flows of people between different subregions in an area, and they can also then be used to make traffic predictions for the road network. And so these matrices are typically developed using data from uh, household surveys as well as roadside surveys. And so these type of surveys, um, they tend to be pretty expensive and time consuming to collect this kind of data. Um, and they also, they only re really represent one snapshot in time, whereas telecom data is passively generated and it can also represent variation throughout, throughout time. But on the other hand, there are also some limitations of using this sort of data for transportation modeling. So for example, th this data doesn't represent all people all the time. It's really a sample of people. Um, you also don't know what, how many people are driving versus using other modes of transportation. And you, it doesn't tell you whether there are multiple people in one vehicle. So I needed some way to be able to correct for these type of biases before I could use this data. So my solution was to start with an OD matrix developed directly from the telecom data, and then using traffic data from a small number of junctions as ground truths to progressively update the OD matrix um, until the traffic estimates from the model match the traffic data. So then the result of this is you end up with an origin destination matrix for every hour of every day. And so this is an example of such a matrix where you see the flows of people from each subregion to each other subregion. So then, once you have this um, type of origin des uh, OD matrix developed, you can start to use this use sort of uh, standard transportation modeling tools in order to generate traffic estimates or traffic predictions for the entire road network. So shown here is um, traffic estimates for the center of Andorra. And so it's great to have traffic estimates for the current situation, but it's often more useful to be able to predict what would happen to the traffic patterns if we were to introduce some sort of an intervention, such as um, a new piece of road infrastructure or a new mobility on demand system. So once you have a calibrated transportation model, it's pretty simple to start to look at these types of scenarios. So on the next slide, I'm showing one sort of intervention that we tested, just sort of a proof of concept, where I'm testing what would happen to the traffic patterns in the center of Andorra if, if Marichal was to be pedestrianized. So you can see as the, we switch between the two scenarios um, and Mayor Shell bec becomes pedestrianized, there are some small changes in traffic congestion in the surrounding area, but the changes are quite small. So then another application of this type of telecom data is in analysis of tourist mobility, and in particular around partic um, big events such as the Cirque du Soleil or the Tour de France in Andorra. So as a first step towards analyzing tourist mobility, one thing that we can do is just to visualize the raw trajectories of the tourists during the time of the events. So here I'm just showing a Saturday when Cirque du Soleil took place. And so Cirque du Soleil takes place at Park Central, uh, right up here. And so based on this visual, it's sort of hard to tell how much of this activity is due to the actual event versus normal activity. So it would be more useful if we could uh, see what's the deviation from a normal day. So one, that, one way we, that we can do this is to use a technique borrowed from image processing called background subtraction. 
So if we consider the activity on an average day as being the background, we can simply subtract this from the activity on, of the day that we're interested in. So on the next slide, the yellow areas are representing areas where there's increased activity compared to an average day, whereas blue represents any decreased activity. So what we find is that in these uh, kind of popular tourist areas, before the event, you have an increase in activity, as well as having a sharp spike in activity at Park Central during the actual time of the event. So then we can also do something similar for Tour de France. So the stage 10 of Tour de France started from Escaldes um, in 2016 and headed towards France. And so now, as we'll see on the next slide, um, in the morning, right at the starting line, there's a sharp spike in activity. But then, in this case, during the rest of the day, the activity was actually decreased. So you see the spike in activity at the starting line representing people watching the beginning, but then it looks like people didn't stay in the center after the start. They either went to another viewing location or possibly just went home afterwards. So the last application I'm going to talk about is in analysis of third places. And third places are those places that people go to sort of socialize, meet up. So these are like restaurants, cafes, bars. Um, and so we're interested in what makes an area successful in encouraging this type of social interaction that's so important for a vibrant city. So I did a cluster analysis of, uh, in order to find the areas in Andorra which are most popular for groups of people to meet up and to stay together for at least 20 minutes. So the different colors you see here are representing distinct clusters of people. And so one thing we find is that as you look at different areas of the day and go between different days also, the largest and most persistent clusters uh, tend to be around the same areas. So this um, interface tool is just allowing to switch between different days and different hours and look at the different clusters of people. And then from here, one thing that we can do is start to look at the different types of amenities that these clusters are forming around. And so in this radar plot, I'm showing the for each cluster, the types of amenities that are close by in terms of shopping, restaurants, cultural activities, etc. So then by looking at patterns here, we can start to get an idea of what type of mix of amenities uh, helps to create this kind of vibrant social place. And so that's my final slide, and I think that's the last uh, presentation in this session, so thank you very much. Oh,